Hello, welcome to Ashley Expert. Today we'll discuss an asset management, condition monitoring. An effective condition monitoring provides many benefits to industry, such as lower maintenance costs, also 24-7 availability and awareness of remote operations, but also provides that key data needed to keep industry up and running. And you can actually start to take some key performance measures using condition monitoring. Today, I have Luke from Brainboxes in the office. Thanks for coming in, Luke. Oh, thanks, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. Could you just tell me a little bit about Brainboxes and the products that you actually supply? Where are they positioned in the market, for example, and what do they do? Sure. So Brainboxes is a manufacturer of industrial automation equipment. So this is equipment that goes on machinery that captures data from sensors and controls actuators. And once the data is captured, it can be analyzed and sent somewhere. It could be across the network or it could be across the world to the cloud. So we're positioned within the industrial automation market, but our background is IT. Uh, so previously, uh, over 15 years ago, we made products that go inside computers that required uh, IT software. And so we've brought that world of IT with us into the OT environment. Oh, cool. Look, I see you brought a product with you today, the BB400. Could you just tell me a little bit about that product, um, where it's positioned and the potential use that you put, to, put it towards? Sure. So this product is bore out of an issue we saw in the marketplace over and over again over a number of years. We'd go on site to a, a, a production environment and always there'd be a process control engineer working on a project and the project would be to monitor and control some machinery. Often they'd use a Raspberry Pi which is a fantastic bit of open source hardware and software in order to create this industrial prototype. So they'd take a Raspberry Pi, connect it to some industrial sensors and actuators. And the challenge these engineers had was how to productionize, take this Raspberry Pi prototype and put it out onto the shop floor. So we kept seeing the issue and we realized that the engineer had two choices. They could try to stick with the Raspberry Pi hardware, which although is a fantastic piece of hardware, isn't suitable for industrial environments, yeah. in which case it would often fail after a few months in the field due to power or EMC. Uh, or they could switch to an industrial hardware platform, which would cost them more time and effort in their development process. So what we did was we combined the Raspberry Pi with industrial hardware yeah. so that the engineer no longer had the choice uh, they had to make that choice between those two options. Instead, they could prototype on a Raspberry Pi and then take it straight into production on this platform. All the software stays the same and it works solidly and reliably in an industrial environment. Yeah. So uh, the, the BB400 uh, contains a number of industrial interfaces. So for example, IO interfaces, RS2324224285, two network connections, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. And this gives you a host of options when wanting to connect to industrial sensors and actuators. So if, if I open the device up, uh, you can see what it's made out of. And the key component here is a Raspberry Pi compute module. So this piece is made by Raspberry Pi. And what we've done is we've added our own custom heat sink to the device. So like I said, Raspberry Pi is a fantastic tool for open source software and hardware development. But we saw that when the device went into an industrial environment, there were certain issues that meant it didn't function as well as it could. So we've addressed the issues with all this extra hardware. So one of the issues is heat. So we've added an industrial heat sink and we've tested the performance of it. The other issue is power. So uh, the Raspberry Pi needs exactly 5.1 volts, but clearly industrial environments don't always have that. Yeah. So we ha we've got a 5 to 30 volt input power supply here, so you can plug it into 12 mm -hmm. volt supply, 24 volt supply. The other nice thing is it's a dual redundant power supply, so you can plug in two different power supplies. If one fails, the other one will automatically take over. So greatly reducing the cost. Absolutely. So the time to market is, in, uh, is improved, it's sped up, and the cost of deploying in, a, in an industrial environment is reduced. I guess in, in terms of that aspect, that there is probably a perception in people's heads that to actually start to get at data and take data from industrial assets, 
you're looking at really high cost, but this is actually giving market penetration at a lower level? Correct. So over the, the last decade, the cost of uh, data capture and analysis has continued to plummet. And uh, in addition, the cost of industrial sensors has come down as well. So technology which used to only be available to high value manufacturing like automotive and aerospace is now available to SMEs. So they can access those same tools because the price point has come down. And the Raspberry Pi platform is an excellent example of where these costs have really reduced. Yeah. So powered by Pi, obviously, then. Yeah, so in, inside this unit, there is a Raspberry Pi and there is also an Arduino. So we, we take these two well-known hardware choices, which come with really excellent open source software libraries and is understood and known really well by particularly people leaving university. Yeah. And we let these tools be available to them to tackle these industrial problems. That's, that's really interesting because uh, obviously when we were talking Raspberry Pi, back in the day. The industrial use for it probably wasn't actually thought about. It was more for uh, to learn programming, for example. But now we're seeing the industrial use of Pi extending that market reach for, for those guys also. Uh, absolutely right. So uh, Pi was initially envisaged to be an educational tool, but such was the quality of the design and the price point that it soon became used in lots of different markets and niches. And industrial automation is one of those niches that it's used in a lot. Okay, so in terms of condition monitoring, um, tapping into data, for example, uh, you'll hear lots of things like um, your your real-time data analysis and, and you know your inputs and your outputs, that real-time IO. What do, what do you need to consider to take that kind of first step about tapping into data? Are there any guidelines or is there anything that people should be aware of of what they need to do to take that first step? Sure, absolutely. So from a management perspective, we're, we're very clear that these tools are now available for everyone to use at a good price point. But there's actually a number of steps to get from the decision to retrofit or to analyze data from a machine to actually implementing that. And there are, there are a few key hurdles along the way. So one of the key hurdles that we came across when doing a project with an outdoor play equipment company was specifying the correct sensors for the job. So all the sensors are readily available. All you need to do is go on RS's website and you can see 100 different temperature monitor sensors, for example. But making sure you have the right choice is the key decision in that process. So what we're trying to do is put together known proven bundles of hardware and hardware and sensors with our products to show customers, okay, if you combine this sensor with this product, then it will work in a particular environment. And that's one of the key issues that customers come to us and say, yes, the technology is available, but my current hurdle is how do I specify the right sensor yeah. to go with hardware such as this to tackle my asset management and monitoring needs? Okay, that's an interesting thing. You're talking about sensors there because we obviously see that there is a growing need and more around the sensor development form, electronic suppliers, uh, for example, are, are looking at MEM sensors and you know putting smart sensors into to, to phones, for example. Yep. Do you find that the growth of the sensors is actually transpiring into the development and um, market appeal for condition monitoring applications? Yeah, so sensors in smartphones has really alerted the general public to what is possible. Uh, using today's technology. And so people are now aware, okay, I can monitor temperature, I can monitor humidity, I can monitor pressure very simply and easily. Now I want to take what I know are readily available tools and apply them to my industrial machinery. So yeah, the proliferation of sensors has certainly increased the awareness in the marketplace of what is possible. And now people are coming to us saying, okay, I know what's possible in a consumer marketplace. I want to apply, apply that into the industrial marketplace. <laughs> Uh, a, a good example of this uh, is my, my watch. It has a built-in heart rate monitor and I can instantly see my heart rate on my watch, on my phone, on the internet. So people know that uh, health monitoring is available today yeah. very cheaply. So they want to apply that same real-time monitoring to industrial equipment. Now the equivalent of a heart rate could well be energy consumption. And we see that as a very common use case for industrial monitoring and asset management. If you can uh, monitor energy consumption of a machine, you can establish a baseline of its usage yeah. and you can start to know what is normal for a particular operation. And then using a product such as this BB400, 
You can then analyze over time energy usage, and then you can see when it deviates outside the norm. When energy usage and other signatures, such as energy usage, deviate from the norm, then it's a signal that the health of the asset is, needs to be improved and maintenance is required on the machine. So over time and analyzing these trends, engineers start to understand things like, okay, if the energy consumption goes up, that means one of the motors has an issue and that means I need to put into effect some preventative maintenance yeah. on the motor before it breaks. So it helps people to move from reactive maintenance, responding to a sudden breakdown of a machine, towards preventative and predictive maintenance where the data captured in real time from the machine informs your future decisions and allows you to schedule things like maintenance during quiet periods. So that's really interesting, Luke. Um, making the analogy between your own personal health and the, the health of machinery and plant makes perfect sense to, to most people. Uh, and obviously, you know, with smartphones, smartwatches, uh, and, and data capture for personal individuals, if you accelerate that out into the industrial field, you can talk about so many more different types of data points. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier was about offering a package of sensors, for example. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that there's more of a, a move, is it towards individual sensors or is it towards a, a more modular kind of uh, application, for example? Sure. Uh, I think that's a really great question and it kind of defines where we are in the maturity of this industry. So at the moment there are a lot of integrated solutions. So that might be, uh, for example, a Bluetooth vibration sensor that goes straight on a machine. The data is instantly captured and, and sent up to the manufacturer's application online. And that's really excellent to get quickly to a solution. But what we find is in the long run, these integrated solutions will be overtaken by modular solutions because the current issue with integrated solutions is adding extra information and pooling data from other sources with, with an integrated solution. Yeah. The second you need an extra data source or an extra sensor to be captured, then you start to come across issues about combining data together. So we think the future of this technology, where the industry is headed, is towards open standards, is towards modularization, and we consider ourselves to be the modular hardware piece in this overall solution. So we want to embrace open standards, embrace open source, and provide a piece in the puzzle for the customer so that it's easy for them to extend this, the ecosystem to capture more and different types of data yeah. without being trapped within the BrainBox's brand for example, and ultimately that will lead to more competition within the industry and ultimately that will uh, make life better for the customer. Okay, that's really interesting that you, you see that approach is, is something which will be happening uh, within the, the industry. There, there is, in the wider industry uh, as well, this uh, approach to modularization being the kind of the optimum to go to and maybe retrofitting using this kind of approach would work significantly. Yeah. But in terms of the the actual technology behind the, the sensors, for example, what, what would be the trade-off between a, a purely digital sensor, for example, or, or analog? And if we're talking asset management, which are those sensor types that are the best to employ? Sure, that's a great question. Both types of signal are important. However, for asset management, we see analog measurements to be one of the key type of measurement because analog will show you the health of a system over time. So a key type of analog signal is, for example, vibration. Another analog signal is temperature. Now, those two signals give a, a status of the health of a machine. So vibration can be used to determine what frequencies at what amplitudes are normal for the behavior of the machine. So for example, a press, when it's running, often uh, a piece of the machine comes down and pushes against another piece. That will generate a signature for vibration. And over time, you can see when that signature changes and you'll be able to tell if the machine has gone out of its spec. Uh, so that's the, the comparison between digital and analog. Whereas a digital signal may tell you if something's off or on or if it's high or low, an analog signal will tell you how it varies over time. Yeah. Both signals are important, but for, particularly for health monitoring and asset management, analog signals we find are particularly important. And I guess probably the, the key to, to that as well is when you start to implement and retrofit for condition monitoring is that there might be a long period of time where 
there's nothing really happening other than the machine is just ticking over normally. Yes, that's right. So uh, when you retrofit, you, what we find is there's, you go from a position of having no data to a posi- or anecdotal data to a position of having facts. And this step change will instantly give insight. So an example of this is a number of years ago within RS Nuneaton's warehouse, uh, we retrofitted some sensors and monitoring on a piece of conveyor equipment that was critical to the functioning of the warehouse. Uh, initially, we were monitoring for the, uh, the location and performance of uh, how the totes were moving around the warehouse. But a byproduct of the monitoring is we were able to see how busy that piece of conveyor was at any given time of the day. And instantly it became clear to the maintenance team that there were periods during the night that were less busy than times during the day. And then there became an unambiguous argument to be made that maintenance should be scheduled during the quieter nighttime yeah. periods rather than the busier daytime periods. So this is a really great example of going from very little or anecdotal data to hard facts and the fact that uh, decisions became unambiguous. However, once you get over those quick wins, then you find that the wins, the, the low hanging fruit is being is taken and then you start to learn new insights more slowly over time. Yeah. And this is where slow changes in analog signal slowly build up a picture of machine health. Yeah. And that's where you can inform your predictive maintenance and your preventative maintenance strategies. So RS got the quick win from understanding when was the best time to schedule maintenance. And then over time, a picture emerged of the health of that piece of conveyor and they developed a strategy for maintenance. Yeah, because I, th- I think probably what people might not necessarily understand is that, for example, your main conveyor feed, if you're a distribution company, for example, your main conveyor feed, which is taking parcels off the conveyor and into the lorries, if that was to break at the most uh, inopportune time where you are totally loaded on the conveyor system, you've got orders backing up, you've got nothing going out the door, you would know by the signature analysis over time that this motor is potentially, which is driving the conveyor system, yeah. is likely to fail. Yes. Now, the cost of replacement is very minimal, yeah. but the cost of downtime, reworking, etc., etc. So these are the things that you would need to consider maybe to amplify and be, you know, these are the reasons why condition monitoring and particularly retrofitting for your most critical assets are an important part to play. Would you agree with that? I I absolutely agree. So uh, in RS's non-Eastern warehouse, 11 o'clock is the time of day that the deadline is for shipping to China. So if uh, goods aren't loaded by that 11 o'clock deadline, then people in China will miss their next day deliveries. So this is critical to the success of RS's delivery performance. And if you can put into effect strategies of asset management and condition monitoring of things like motors on conveyors, then you can plan your maintenance rather than react to sudden stoppages. And this really changes the game from a position of waiting for a problem to occur to planning when you're going to uh, refresh a system and maintain a system. So it's a game changer in terms of planning for maintenance and time and cost saving for the company and ultimately delivery performance and the expectations of the customer. Okay. In terms of condition monitoring then, are there any parameters which you suggest? You you mentioned um, energy and vibration, but if I was to say, look, what are the the three main assets or the three main conditions which are going to give you kind of effective information that you need for planning for maintenance? Would you be able to give me three off the top, for example? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, so for a generic machine, we typically look at measuring vibration, temperature, energy consumption, and throughput. So that's four signals. One of those signals is operational, and the other three are related to the asset's health. If you can measure those four signals, then you can quickly gain a picture of the performance of a piece of equipment. Uh, The price point of doing this as well is not very high in today's market. We have a customer who put together this selection of sensors and had a budget for each one of their machines. However, once we used the BB400 plus a number of sensors, that came in under half of their existing budget. So that brings us to the question of, you know, okay, those are the baseline of things you should measure. Is there anything else you should measure too? And what we say is if you think there's a potential for something to affect the performance of the machine, 
Because the cost of the sensor is minimal, it's worth additionally adding that monitoring on as well. Yeah. Uh, especially the incremental cost. If you've got a system in place with five sensors, adding one extra sensor is a, a minimal cost. And it, it may not tell you anything, but it may be the key to unlocking how to improve the performance of that particular machine. Uh, another, another example, on the brain boxes production line, we had a particular machine which uh, needed maintenance due to uh, its performance, but it, it appeared random at what point the maintenance was required. Mm -hmm. And what we find is problems that appear random look random because you're not measuring enough data. And as soon as you start measuring sufficient inputs, actually a pattern emerges that was hidden to you previously. So if a customer has a known bottleneck on their plant, we, we say that you should start measuring as much as you possibly can, and the, the reasons for the bottleneck will soon become clear, and only then can you put in an effective strategy to improve performance. So measuring is key in order to improve where you're at. You need a baseline in order to know the changes you've made have yeah. had an impact. Okay, so it's important to understand the data you're measuring, the impact it has, what you would then take in from that data to then effectively deploy in terms of a maintenance strategy, for example, or you know predictive failure, for, for example. But in terms of the, the world of um, Industry 4.0, the, there are a lot of terms that people are probably not familiar with in terms of, well, you can capture as much data as you want. What do you do with that data is your decision. Where you put it to is your decision. But there are things like, well, do, you, do we send data which is primarily real-time data, do we send that to the cloud or do we do some processing on the edge? You know, in terms of sort of like if you were looking at the, the health and in terms of where you want that data to appear, are there any guidelines that you would associate with that? Yes, so we, in, in terms of data capture and where to send data, we have some uh, preferences that we guide the customer on. So typically in a factory, there's already connectivity. So where possible, we advise a wired ethernet connection for data capture so that the data can be sent out somewhere. If wired ethernet's not available, then we advise wireless ethernet, Wi-Fi. If that's not available, if the location's more remote, then we typically go to a cellular yeah. collection, connection. And in extreme environments, we go to a satellite or iridium connection. A really good example of this is the British Antarctic Survey. So the British Antarctic Survey, based in Antarctica, around the South Pole, have been uh, performing scientific uh, experiments for over 60 years. But of course, in the last uh, 10 years, the prospect of global warming has melted the ice and where their base is, the ice has cracked. So they had to move their base from its original location to a new location on a new ice shelf. And because of the health and safety concerns around the melting ice, they, decide, they asked themselves the question, can we run this base remotely without oh, okay. the station being manned? Yeah. And that's where they used our products along with micro turbine to try to remotely monitor and control the power supply to the base so they could still carry on running these scientific experiments, yeah. uh, such as monitoring the hole in the ozone layer remotely from Cambridge through a satellite link. It's a really fascinating case study. Yeah. Uh, our, our products were involved, uh, there is a, a diesel tank holding 100 tons of oil. The diesel tank, uh, we pump a few hundred liters into the micro turbine each day into that cell. And our products are monitoring the flow and the pressure and the levels of the diesel within the system. Uh, clearly, this is an, an environmental issue. Yeah. We don't want to be spilling any diesel anywhere. We want to make sure there are no leaks in the system. But one of the big benefits they've discovered from running the location unmanned is that energy usage is down 90% on the days where there is no people at the base. So they run the base for six months of the year during the winter without any people really? on site. And so this equipment has to withstand extreme low temperatures, extremely windy conditions in the very difficult environment, and there is no one within hundreds of miles of them if anything goes wrong. So it has to be totally reliable and totally robust. Their initial experiment was to run for six months and make sure that they uh, had a functioning robust system. However, they, they realized that the system was working extremely well. 
they ran for nine months unmanned and a further three months manned. So in total, the system's been running for 12 months and has been monitoring and controlling the energy going to uh, power the base and to run the experiments uh, to monitor things like the ozone layer. So yeah. it's a really fascinating case study. That's, that's a really, like you mentioned, I I extreme conditions. I think you've, you've brought a few photographs and a, an example to show us where your products were actually used in the Antarctic survey, yes? Yes. Yeah, so this particular image is taken inside the micro turbine chamber. So the yellow products are analog input modules and they are monitoring the pressure of the oil, the levels of the oil, uh, yeah. the diesel, and the flow of the diesel throughout the system. So they're making sure that the accurate amount of diesel is pumped into the cell, that the micro turbine is doing its job and consuming the diesel at the right speed and at the right levels, and they're making sure there are no leaks within the system. All of this can be monitored and controlled from Cambridge back in the UK, despite being near the South Pole, thousands of miles away across the world over a satellite link. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, fant yeah we, re we were really pleased when we came across that survey. Uh, we, we often find that our customers buy products through the likes of RS, and then only when they have a particular technical question do we find out where those products are used and what they're used for. And we, we love feel, fielding technical support from our customers because we get to find out how and why products are used in the field. Okay, so this is the cell used by the British Antarctic Survey to power the Halley 5. Uh, station and this produces all the energy required for the unmanned station to operate and in fact it also produces the energy for when it's manned so if we have a quick look around the cell you can see it has things inside which are involved with pumping fuel it's got items which are involved with uh, pressures and flows and temperatures and here within the cell of the brain boxes products so these particular analog input products are monitoring the flows and the pressures and the levels of the diesel within the system uh, we've got the, the fuel pumps down here, we've got the power ban balancing panel, uh, we've got a fuel filter, and we've got micro turbine in there as well. So each day about 130 litres of diesel is pumped into this cell and uh, that is used to generate power through the micro turbine to power the Halley 5 base camp to ensure that the smooth operation of the different experiments that they're performing on the site. Some of the experiments are meteorological, some of them are involving uh, the view of the night sky and some of them are involving measuring the ozone layer and of course measuring the ice itself and the effects of global warming on the planet. It's a very important work they're doing and it's really fascinating to see how they can man this remotely. There's no one here for at least six months of the year during the winter period and yet all the experiments continue to run in 24-7. Look, if we could just go back to um, this question of edge processing versus sending to the cloud. Now there's a lot of noise around at the moment that 5G will change industry the way that 4G changed the consumer market, for example. But in terms of cost versus efficiency and low latency, where does, where does that play within? Do I process at the edge or do I send to the cloud? Yeah, so some of the big questions involved in this is, what is the cost of processing at the edge versus what is the cost of transmitting data to a cloud server and what is the cost of storage in the cloud? So anyone who has a cloud-based account will know that their bills vary month to month and the bills are based on usage. So if we can limit usage so that the cost is only for things that are really relevant to us, uh, then we can uh, reduce our bills and still get all the benefits of asset management. So the way we recommend doing this is using edge processing. Edge processing is particularly important with condition monitoring because often with condition monitoring, signals don't change very much day to day. And you're only really concerned about events or errors or exceptions. Yeah. So we recommend that you do as much as edge processing as possible, particularly when you have a cellular connection, particularly when you're sending data to the cloud uh, and the bill uh, is becoming an issue. So if you do edge processing where possible and only send the events which are exceptional to the cloud, then you're, uh, you're still getting all the benefits of asset management okay. without uh, as much cost.
Yeah, so you're still getting all that relevant information that you need to make informed decisions. Yes. At much reduced cost. Exactly. The other nice area that comes into play here is AI. So at the moment, AI, uh, we consider to be used a lot as a marketing and a rebranding term. Many companies are taking software that they already have, and rather than calling it software algorithm, they're yeah. calling it AI. But the future, that won't be the case. In the future, AI will really come into play. And you'll see situations where machine learning is done in the cloud, and then a model of the machine learning is pushed down to the edge. And now the edge can get the benefits of the machine learning model, and it can perform its analysis on the data it can see around it. Okay. And, it can o and then it will push up relevant data back to the cloud. So this is a really nice example of yeah. using cloud computing uh, with lots of CPUs and lots of processing power in the p cloud to develop a model, yeah. and then pushing that model down to the edge device to analyze the data that it can see and is available to it. OK, that's really an interesting consideration, which probably one that I, I haven't actually thought of or understood myself. But um, in, in terms of the, the general u user, for example, who's, who's looking to do this, it, it, there, there's quite a lot of things that they would need to consider as well. And, and I guess one of those as well would be the, the pros and cons of um, condition monitoring, for example. To invest, obviously, they're looking for payback. And when the machine goes wrong, that's when you can see, OK, we predicted this, this is payback. Mm. But in terms of um, new machinery, for example, or versus retrofit, what, what's your, your take on, on that? Yeah, so uh, th there's, there's a few ways of looking at this issue. So years ago, when we would talk to plant managers, they always understood the benefit of buying a new machine and what extra productivity that would deliver them. But that benefit always comes at a cost. And the cost is shop floor space and often having to have an extra member of staff trained to run that particular machine. And the argument that we, was made to them uh, which is now well understood, is that you can often get the benefit of an extra machine by improving the efficiency and performance of your existing machines. And so, years ago, this was a difficult decision for plant managers to weigh up the benefit of buying a new machine versus retrofitting sensing on their existing fleet yeah. of machinery. Today, that benefit is much clearer because, like I say, the price point of monitoring data and capturing data from sensors has come down significantly. And the cost of new machines hasn't changed particularly. So, for example, in some industries, a new machine might cost half a million pounds, whereas retrofitting existing machines might cost £10,000 per machine or for, for an expensive setup. Yeah. Uh, so clearly there's a benefit if you can get 5% in performance increase on 20 machines versus buying one new machine. Yeah. And so we see that retrofit is becoming a very big factor in people's decision-making process when they're evaluating how to increase the efficiency of their production line. Yeah. Another benefit of retrofit is that new machines have all these integrated sensors and this integrated data analysis. But it comes back to the, the trade-off between integrated and modular approaches. So if you buy a new machine from brand X, you may have their integrated solution, but this all stays within their own realm yes. of brand X. Yes. So as soon as you try to combine the data from your brand X machine with other brands that you also own and other age machines which you also own, it becomes very difficult to pull that data together. Yeah. So we see customers who buy new machines which already have all this integration but then retrofit, retrofit and so that yeah. they have a unified way of accessing all the data on their shop floor. Yeah. So I think uh, sometimes it's not a decision between retrofit and new, sometimes you want to always retrofit so you have a unified platform to access data. Now this will change over time as industries adopt open standards and open protocols, but there's always resistance within industries because manufacturers want to maintain profit margins yeah. and they feel threatened by other people being those that the data goes to and they feel like they might lose the data and lose the insight the data provides but ultimately this will benefit the customer and so it, it will it will happen because the cu the customer is the one that wins and the customer will make demands of manufacturers that they, they want open systems modular systems so they can take data out of new machines they can get data out of old machines and they can pull all that data together wherever they wish yeah. uh, a, a good example of this uh, we're working with a pharmaceutical company in the in Yorkshire who make everyday well-known household brands of pharmaceuticals. 
they've retrofitted some machines on their production line to count throughput. Now this is just the first step in a journey. Uh, often you want to consider your other things as well. For example, lean manufacturing. There's no point retrofitting if you haven't already got the benefits of what lean can offer you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're simply measuring what you already know, that you can improve performance, but you haven't done it yet. Yeah. So we advise customers to you know, go down the journey of lean manufacturing and then start the journey of industry four and in industrial monitoring and asset management. So this pharmaceutical company in Yorkshire uh, used the BB400, retrofitted on their existing machines, started measuring throughputs, and this one simple signal unlocks a lot of information for them. It starts them to understand the operational performance of their machines. They can see uptime when, for example, the throughput suddenly drops, the machines are no longer on. After the machines have been off for a period of time, a screen appears asking the operator to say why the machines yeah. have currently stopped. And now they can capture data on uptime and downtime and categorize their downtime. So this is a really excellent step on that journey. Yeah. The next steps would could be what we've also discussed, which would be vibration monitoring, energy consumption monitoring, temperature monitoring. But in terms of a journey, yeah, it's good to make these steps and to see progress and get buy-in from the team and the organization. Yeah. And then once everyone's on board, you can fully embrace this kind of technology. Now this particular customer uses Microsoft BI, which is business intelligence tools in the cloud. So our device captures the data, sends it up to Microsoft BI, and then using familiar tools, such as what you might see in Microsoft Excel, but more advanced versions of them, mm -hmm. they can quickly dashboard and inter interrogate their data and this is a really excellent step for companies to take on that journey. Yeah. Would you then say, that's interesting that you, you, you touched upon uh, interrogating the, the data. So in, in terms of when it comes to, to retrofit, for example, obviously you've got to know what you're doing in terms of how the, the uh, machine operates, where the data points are. But in terms of analysing the data, you don't necessarily need to be the technician, for example. Maybe in terms of if you understand that, you know, more energy use means that there's a, an issue. Yep. The dashboard will give you lots of information, so you don't necessarily need to be the machine technician, for example. No, absolutely. So the, uh, in a typical organization, most organizations are already familiar with dashboarding when it comes to financial data. And it's those same tools you can now apply to production data and to maintenance data and operational data. So the people within the organization that are already familiar with those tools, for, for example, financial reporting, can reapply those tools to manufacturing reporting. And that's why in the, the case we just talked about, Microsoft BI was the obvious choice. Yeah. They were already using it within their organization to understand other areas of data in the business and they reapplied the same tools to the operational data. Yeah, it's quite interesting. We always say, if you want to get buy-in, get the buy-in from the financial guy. Yeah, that's Absolutely. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if the financial director understands the proposition, then you're probably well on the way to implementing. Well, that's great. Um, just before we finish, um, I know you've gone through a few examples, but are there any other examples where your products, you know, maybe something more extreme as well, where your products are being used? Yeah, so uh, th there's a number of really interesting case studies we've got. A, a fascinating one is uh, the Apex Telescope in the Atacama Desert. So this uh, telescope is run by the Max Planck Institute. And the Max Planck Institute are based in Germany and the Apex Telescope is in South America. So in order to monitor and control this telescope, they need to remotely uh, connect to it and operate the telescope. So our products are used to remotely uh, control the pitch and the azimuth of the Apex Telescope. Yeah. And really brilliantly, last year, the Apex Telescope was one of the key telescopes used to capture the first ever image of a black hole. A black hole. And, and this black hole f image has gone around the world, is now famous. And it's, it's really brilliant that we were one of the small pieces in that chain to make that image happen. Well, that's absolutely amazing. So. You've gone from the extreme of the Antarctic to the extreme of the desert, yeah. and you're looking at um, ozone layers, and you're looking up towards the sky for the, the black holes, for example. Yeah, that's what, right. more, what more could we want? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really fascinating that, you know, in science and nature, and uh, in, in the desert, and in the 
uh, in the snow are all the same problems that you encounter in an industrial environment. Extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, issues with people not being there when things go wrong. So you need your equipment to be absolutely reliable and you need to be able to trust the data that is generating and know that it's doing its job. So knowing that it will work in uh, the, the South Pole and knowing it will work in the Atacama Desert should give customers confidence that it will also work in their factory. Fantastic. Well, that's been really insightful today. Um, I knew condition monitoring and asset management, there was so much more that we, we probably could still talk about, but we've, we've covered quite a lot of uh, interest in applications, but also a lot of the key points around data points that are important to measure if you want to see results. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily the results that you're expecting to get up front that are going to be the ones that are most profitable when you give the RS Nunny an example. That's right. Uh, there's a lot of um, byproducts of capturing data because people go from a position of anecdotal evidence to a position of hard facts. And it's like switching the light on to uh, a situation. And suddenly things that were not clear previously are suddenly very obvious. And uh, the, the benefits can come in the places you least expect. Fantastic. Thanks very much for coming in today. I really enjoyed our discussion on condition monitoring. And I would like to thank Brainboxes for coming in and presenting their products, but also their experience. And we'll see you again in the next edition of DesignSpark Ask the Expert. Thank you very much, Greg.